Today on Herd and Feed TV, what does a roast, a shoe, and a syringe have to do with antibiotics and herd health? You're curious now, aren't you? Veterinarian and consultant Dr. Scott Tripp from Amelicor recently spoke at the Herd and Feed Management Conference in Las Vegas, speaking about antibiotics for large animals. And it all started with a roast, a shoe, and a syringe. So a roast. My wife, uh, Judy, came back from a meeting where she talked about a story of a grandmother who cut the end of the roast off before she cooked it. Well, the daughter learned from her, and this passed on through three generations until a great-granddaughter great asked the grandmother why she did that, and the answer was simple. It's because it didn't fit in the pan. So that tradition passed through for no good reason other than it didn't fit. But it started me to think, what do we do that is similar? What traditions do you have that you believe are correct and are not? So it could be feed, labor, pen, calf care, use of antibiotics. Well, this causes inefficiencies and this causes variation. And one way I look at variation is to look at daily noise. So this is in PRODSTAT, and it looks at the variation between 90 and 120 days for stage one heifers. So in a, in a process that is stable, you shouldn't see a lot of variation. The variation day to day is very compact. So when you get a lot of variation uh, in a system, it means you've got a lot of noise, a lot of factors that are varying every single day in your management. So that is one way to look at it. Now a shoe, sorry for the gross picture, but I had an ingrown toenail. Of course, being a man and a doctor, this was after a week of me thinking it will get better and soaking it and doing all the traditional things, right? I then visited my family doctor who prescribed clindamycin. Great spectrum, should have covered it. It didn't get better. So a week later, I went to instant care and they did surgery on my toe and kept me on the same antibiotic because the coverage was good. Well, since they bandaged my toe, I could not wear my shoes out of instant care, okay? So they gave me a foot sock to wear, but being unstable, I put the sock in my spare shoe and I went home. However, the next day when I was hurrying to go to the airport, I put my shoes on and thought, my toe is really swollen. It hurts and I could barely, barely walk on it. Being a doctor, I immediately started to think of the pain medication dosage I was certainly going to need. You know, aspirin wasn't gonna cover it. You know, I was going towards the opioids because it was so painful. And I really brought the sock, so if any of you want to try it, I'll be happy to let you. Well, four hours later, a remarkable miracle cure occurred. I remembered to take the sock out of my shoe. Immediately, the pain went away. It then started me to think, do we do the same thing to our cows or calves? Do the same thing with our employees? We limit them with our own ideas from a different perspective too far away from the actual action to know what should be done. We limit them to what we think. And then I come to a syringe management in the bottle. It's been going on for years and years and years and years. How do I know that's true? Because in the last 30 days, I've gotten this, these questions asked to me on farms that I'm still responsible for the antibiotics. The weather's changing. We need to put the calves all on crumbles. If four cc's doesn't work, you must use eight. That stuff doesn't work. My neighbor uses this and it cures everything. And how many of your neighbors steal and fuse cows? Well, there's a meeting coming up about antibiotic stewardship. And in quick, there's 270 million prescriptions written every year in human health. About 30% are unnecessary. In Animal Act 2, stewardship is of growing importance to help ensure that antibiotics are used appropriately 
judiciously to optimize health outcome without reducing negative, negative consequences. Bottom line, antibiotic resistance is a crisis in human health. It could be the crisis in animal health if we don't get on top of it, says Dr. King. And after six years of discussion, we can clearly see that while improvements have been made globally, we are probably further behind that we're in 2011. So you are seeing changes on antibiotics. So the adoption of FDA guidance and changes to the veterinary feed directive to eliminate the use of medically important antibiotics to promote growth in food animals has been a game changer for production animal agriculture. So you will see more. Here's a case for California. All drugs are now scripted. First state in the nation. So what you used to go buy is now scripted. And the bottom line from the governor, the science is clear that the overuse of antibiotics in livestock has contributed to the spread of antibiotic resistance and the undermining of decades of life-saving advances in medicine. So the main buzz from the professional side is reduce antibiotic use and to start with mastitis. It did start me to think about organic herds and do they have low SCC. This is two herds, one in Washington, one in Vermont. You can see they're under 80,000 year round. So I asked the question, how do they do that? Well, the number one, as I dug deeper, was they deal with their people and focus on milking procedures. The second thing is they focus on environment. Clean and dry. You've known this message for years. It hasn't changed. Clean and dry all the time. And finally, equipment function to check the system both static and under load. It's not rocket science. The basics are always the same. They achieve it because they have to. So the question begs, what are we doing about it where we lean on this other crutch? So I think we've forgotten this one principle. Ultimately, it's the immune system that eliminates infections. Antibiotic drugs just help make the pathogens more susceptible to attack. We think it's all about the drug. It's really all about the immune system. And I can tell you now, within the professional circle, cir circles that I deal with, we talk about immunity in different ways now. We talk about systemic immunity, gut immunity, local immunity uh, in the nose. So we are learning far more about the protective mechanisms within the animal to deal with immunity. And there's exciting stuff that are coming down the line. This I want you to uh, understand. This was a study, it was released in 1999. We've known this for a long time. Overall bacteria cure rate on seven different antibiotic treatments against no treatment. Seven of the drugs we knew about against no treatment. The overall bacteria cure rate for the 21 mastitis pathogens was 68%. Antibiotic treated cases had a higher cure rate, 75 to 65, 10%, 10%. Antibiotic treatments that significantly differed from the untreated cure rates were amoxicillin, erythromycin, cloxicillin, and pyridomycin. Okay? So, we're now fine tuning mastitis treatments. And we're going to start with the biggest use, and you'll probably see this discussion more and more on your own farms. Mastitis is an $80 billion a year pharmaceutical business. Of that 80 billion, two thirds of it is for dry cow therapy. Two thirds of that 80 billion. So one opportunity is selective dry cow therapy. What is uh, selective dry cow therapy? We can write a report that when you go to dry that cow, if she sh shows no signs of mastitis. If her last three tests have been under 200,000, uh, it's over seal and go. Don't treat them. Don't dry cow treat them. What's the economics? On a 1,100 cow herd, basically either using tomorrow's spectrum mass, the costs are different, we all know that, but it's a savings of about 12,000 or more a year. 
that alone covers your cost of DHIA testing. So it's huge, huge savings back to the farm just by selecting the cows you want to dry treat. Antibiotic therapy is like looking at the crash. All the infection occurred before. What you're dealing with is the aftermath, okay? So one thing to think about is stop treating gram negatives that are non-severe. It is clear there is no benefit in getting cows back to productivity. Stop treating cows with no bacterial growth. These animals have cleared the infection and all you're dealing with is the aftermath. The facts are approximately 25 to 35 percent of all clinical mastitis cases result in no bacterial growth. Some researchers in Minnesota carried this idea further. They asked the question, uh, comparing blanket treatments versus selective treatments uh, based on culture and severity. They showed a reduction over 50% of antibiotic use, while not observing differences in days to clinical cure, bacteriological cure, treatment failures, linear score, milk production risk, or calling death. The facts are, the research showed that even delaying 24 hours to treatment to get the culture results, there is no delay in healing. There is no difference between the groups in clinical cure, next test day milk production, average linear score, and the test results would allow you to then get some knowledge back about calling for myco, staph A, and prototheca. Here's one on-farm culture system. It is by the University of Minnesota. Many of you are familiar with it. There are some labs on farm. My guess is if you leave this meeting, you'll start thinking more about having one. This is PCR data. Um, I do work for a farm that has PCR data that every mastitis case runs it. Uh, I want you to look at the number of organisms per cow. We used to think uh, that mastitis was a single organism event. It's not. It's a multi-organism event. So then you've got to start thinking about if I choose the sensitivity for this organism, what's it doing against this one over here? And so uh, the way we manage mastitis has to change, has to change. In conclusion, we're in a battle of survival. We believe bacteria has been around for 3.5 billion years before there's even oxygen on Earth. Uh, we, according to science, have been around 200,000 years. So the bacteria, viruses, have been around a heck of a long than we have. They have been evolving a lot longer than we have. They have built defenses. So I, I put a microscope down here. I want you to uh, look at the face of the enemy, and that's it. And this is a, a medicillin-resistant staph aureus, or MRSA. And I want you to think about how many of you have staph aureus in your herd that you just treated with an antibiotic. All you're doing is colluding with the enemy. You're giving the bacteria information about what we are trying to do to kill it that it passes on, all right? So it is the enemy and we have to be different in our approaches of what we're going to do to beat it. So with that, thank you for your attention. As a tip, Dr. Tripp also said, you can use herd management software to track treatments, but be sure to provide notes on those treatments in English and in Spanish so key personnel can get that information. Now, if you want more information on great herd and RX management tools, give the folks at Amelacor a call. Ultimately, Dr. Tripp stressed that disease prevention is important, so really be aware of how often you use antibiotics. We've got some great topics in the pipeline for next episodes of Herd and Feed TV, so be sure to hit that subscribe button below. And if you liked what you saw today, you can also hit that thumbs up link also below this video. We'll see you next time on Herd and Feed TV.